Okay, I'm going to start now. It seems like we have a full house. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully you guys saw the uh, the video from last time. Um, uh, but I'm going to guess that you probably didn't, so <laughs> I'll go over it a little bit. Um, but uh, first I want to go over the uh, comments. Oh, Seifert's online. I hope he comes join us. Um, uh, comments from last time. So I posted it to the internet. Um, the internet is uh, not a friendly place, so most people were uh, uh, angry at me for uh, uh, having the audacity to uh, I don't know. Record, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the first most complaint was that I guess I say um too much. So if you all would do me a huge favor and take the eraser that's on the side of the blackboard and wear it, it becomes an eraser missile. And if I by chance uh, say um, uh, if you could beam me with that eraser, that would that would help me a great deal. So, yeah, everybody says um. I thought I. Yeah, I mean, I, I say it every second or third word. I personally thought it was very charming, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, nice, good. Okay, is everybody ready? Uh, how do I mean take? I mean, I mean, uh, left click, take copy. Um, okay, so um. <laughs> hmm. It wasn't very here, let's try again. Um Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I might need to trim the volume in the in world a little bit. There we go. Okay. So that was uh that was actually the primary comment. Uh don't say um. The second comment was speed things up, which I already have failed to do, so I'm gonna speed things up. Now um, no! <laughs> uh, um, uh, okay, just don't say anything. The third comment was that I was using uh, closed source and expensive software uh, to do these classes. And uh, that's not cool, I agree. So today what we're going to do is we're going to shift over to open source software and talk about that software and talk about uh, uh, the closed source versions that are also cool. Did I say um? Crap. Now you're not allowed to throw them at me when I don't say um, because then I'll, that'll just confuse me. Yeah, nice. Okay. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say ah uh, either. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, if you watched last class, uh, you saw that what I was talking about is uh, cellular simulation. Um, mm, there we go. And the idea behind cellular simulation is that uh, I throw down things that are like cells, and I give them rules to configure themselves. And the hope is that by doing this, I can create extremely cool organic sorts of systems uh, uh, <laughs> by, by making the appropriate rules. Blackboard just went offline. Yeah. Disconnected. Why did you disconnected? Huh. Okay, are we back? <laughs> We're back. Yeah. Yeah, over overflow. So here I have a little drawing of um, some cells. Uh, <laughs> it's really hard not to say that. It's impossible. I know. I feel your pain. Uh, uh, but if you <laughs> throw erasers at me, actually, maybe we should set up some kind of electroshock thing. That would probably be the most successful. Yeah, <laughs> turn up the volume on the on the uh, erasers. So. 
Uh, mm. What we did last time was create a uh, system of veins for cellular sim simulation. And my hope was to use that as my new cave system here in Second Life. The idea was that we uh, create a system of cells which connect to each other uh, in chains, and they branch off, and then we, uh, we use that description to uh, create caves or veins or whatever. But what I also want to do, um, which is more interesting to me, is to is to create other organic uh, systems. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna forget about ums for a minute so that I can talk. The files, so uh, the files for this stuff uh, I will post online. I did so uh, for last session um, and they're organized into what I call runs. Each run is a little bitty experiment. Um, let's go back and look at the final experiment from last time. So here is the vein system I was talking about, the circulatory system uh, with cells growing. You can see the uh, pulsing of the cells as each cell is added. Cells are added according to a rule uh, regarding uh, density. So if there's enough room in the area and uh, a certain probability threshold has been passed, then it'll create a new cell. Uh, the cells grow over time. Uh, and they're constrained to be within a cube, which is the uh, also important part, which you'll notice in a second here. Yeah, it kind of is, uh, uh, it is very much like tunnel, uh, ant tunnels. And the idea is that uh, this uh, building that you're in right now will be replaced by uh, the system when meshes roll into Second Life. And it makes a very cool little uh, organic brain looking thing, which I was very happy with. But uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, creating skin like how many cells in that simulation uh, I don't know mm, let's see uh, so so all these files uh, will be available in fact these files are available they were available last time uh, but the file format is very simple oh, hang on Yes, it did look like a brain in the end. If I needed to grow a brain for a creature, say, this would be <laughs> a done deal. Uh, so using this file format, that has 4,000 cells? I don't think that's right. Uh, I think that was... Th it, the animation ended around frame 1,700. Oh, yeah, 4,000. 4,500 cells. Um, yeah, although it's really hard for me to watch the chat, so if you guys can, uh, are they spheres? <laughs> you need to, ah, well, so there's a video from last time that discusses exactly what they are. Uh, but what they are is, um, if you're familiar with metaballs, 
how long did it take to generate that animation? It uh, different parts of it took different. Uh, I don't know total, honestly, uh, but not more than on the order of a day. Especially the rendering. The rendering is uh, is ambient occlusion, so that takes a little bit more effort to render. Uh, but those caves there, the cells were rendered uh, like metaballs using an implicit uh, uh, implicit surface or ISO surface. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, set of software. Um, yeah, you should just go back and watch the other video. Uh, it would, I think, it would be bad to recover that material. So what I did. After I got done with the set, uh, with the veins, because I was so happy with them, could I have a link? Uh, I'll give you one at the end of class for. You need an assistant. Yeah, I do. Uh, who? I actually don't know who's talking right now. Who was that? That was me, Jess. Jess? Jess, will you be my assistant for the moment? Um, <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to. Uh, well, usually Reed is teacher's pet, but he didn't show up, so, yeah. Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> uh, do you know where the, uh, files are? They're in... Uh, well, I'll let somebody else dig that up. So the files, uh are animated, or blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, getting to the point of today's class, I ran a bunch of experiments. Let's see. Run 13. I don't think Run 13 has anything interesting in it. I'll, I'm going to give it to you guys anyway, but, you know, whatever. Uh, run 14 starts with the interesting stuff. Okay, so here I took the same rules and uh, I constrained it to a square plane. Uh, Ta-da! The idea being that uh, I want to start generating skins. So skins are two-dimensional, so let's constrain it to 2D. Uh, that created that. Uh, and then... Uh, in 15... Okay, your question's to me, and I am, and I'll forward them to Carl when he's closer to the end of the class. Well, if you could, uh, it's, I honestly, uh, want you guys to interrupt me, um, oh, well, I can do that. yes, if you would interrupt me with the questions, because it's, I think it works much better if we have a, a back and forth. Um, okay. so yeah, if you would, uh, if you would read the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Jess. So... Uh, here's another example of, of skin stuff, uh, very similar to the first one, uh, just higher density. Um, what I'm looking at here now is maybe trying to use this to render some sort of zebra stripe pattern. Um, if I needed to grow a zebra, now I could maybe grow his brain and the pattern on his skin. So, you know, we're, we're slowly working up our toolkit. Uh... Here, I constrained it to a sphere, yay, uh, and in the implicit surface generator, I made the cells, the metaballs, uh, twice as big. So they sort of overlap, kind of blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, and I should point out that in each of these directories, if you look at the readme file, constrain to a surface of a sphere, modify uh, ISO service to take a size multiplier. It talks about what the changes are. And if you want to look at the ISO code, um, oops, isn't it called ISO? ISO. Uh, what? That's weird. That's weird. Well, I don't know. It seems to have disappeared. Okay, so then I moved into changing the rules around that attempt to simulate trees. Ah, uh, okay, so trees, uh, it is it is kind of similar. Um, trees, they do it by branch. Uh, they're really good at generating trees, uh, but I want 
uh, things other than trees. So yeah, it's it's kind of similar to the uh, to L systems for trees. The idea here uh, and the similarity is that it's procedural. Um, if, for instance, you needed a tree, like say one project that I s almost started to work on was to uh, get trees to consume a house. Um, if you needed, you could modify the trees to say grow around the the shape of the house, um, um, or in our case, cells. So here is I've turned off the connectivity on the cells business. So now we just have uh, a sphere full of cells, equally uh, spaced though. That's that's important. Um, is it recursive? Is it recursive? No. Uh, the rules for the particles here. <laughs> Damn you! None of you went to last class. None of you did your homework. Okay. So let me talk about the rules a little bit. So the so what we're doing here is we have what is known as a particle system, which is just a set of points that have uh, I've added size and orientation to, and then we uh, give them rules. Uh, they repel each other. so that they don't overlap um, and that gives them so, sort of a physical presence. Um, they reproduce uh, when they have room. They are constrained inside some kind of shape. And for the veins, at least, we have this uh, connectivity. Oh yeah, there is uh, there is a link to last week's or last month. These will probably get up to being once a week, but right now I'm kind of slammed at home. Um, and then these, the veins, at the least, have connectivity. Okay, so that was the set of rules for last week, or last time. Uh, now we're going to start, I'm going to start futzing with those rules. So with that sphere that I just showed you, uh, I turned off the, you know, I put it on a sphere, I turned off the connections. Uh, if I needed to, actually if I pull that back up, give you an idea of where I'm going with that. Uh, this is going to uh, very shortly become what I call a fly's eye. I've been dreaming about simulating these uh, eyeballs for f growing fly's eyes on stuff for a long time now. So, uh, you know, just to give you a glimpse of what we're going to be doing next session, uh, I will hopefully have this uh, rendering like a fly's eye. And then, um, uh, and then once we have this stuff, we can start because it's procedural. Well, let me get to that in a little bit. Because you, well, let me get to that in a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so here we go. Now we're starting to play with the rules a little bit more. Um, I am obviously modifying the size based on uh, position and we're getting something that might look like an arrangement of scales on a fish. So if we needed to create uh, a zebra fish with flies, eyes, and a brain now, we could uh, grow such a thing, maybe, with a bunch of damn whole lot of work. Uh, I wanted go over this stuff much faster. Um, but does it do the dishes? Hey, Raptor, I'm going to ask that you turn off your sound effect, because uh, it's coming through kind of loud over here. Maybe I should just turn down the little volume. Maybe I can... Uh, more rules. Uh, this, obviously, uh, more changing the size based on position. Not too... 
complicated. Oh, this is kind of cool too. Um, I like this because it reminds me of. Uh, thank you, Raptor. Um, this reminds me of maybe uh, sunflower seed growth, which is also mathematical in another way. But this uh, this is kind of arbitrary. Uh, like that's a Fibonacci sort of uh, uh, exponential spiral thing. This isn't, but it's it's more flexible than that, I think. Is Cypher in the audience? Cypher, do you hear? No? He's my... Yeah, Cypher's here. Oh, hi. Yeah, he's my... He's my mathematician friend. He can tell me uh, the name of that spiral. Uh, okay, so I think that's the point at which I stop playing with growing different kinds of skins. Uh, and I don't want to do 21 just yet, I want to do 22. Oh. There we go. Okay, so 22 I got back to the caves. Um, and my uh, goal here was to create more uh, variety in the uh, uh, create more variety in the size of the veins, and you can see that there's more variety in the size of the veins, and that's accomplished by just uh, uh, I think it's increasing the growth rate or giving it a different curve. Okay, so since none of you were at last class, let me talk about how I generate the uh, the caves a little bit for this next bit. Um, looks like you could add a heart. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so they are implicit surfaces. Uh, what an implicit surface is, is a mathematical function um, that... Uh, where the f uh, in three dimensions. So for x, y, and z, the function returns a number, a real number between or uh, any number. But the places where that function is equal to zero is where the surface is. So if we look at the ISO code here, I think it's called sphere function. Yes. Here we have the mathematical function that uh, computes uh, the implicit surface for the mesh. Uh, but uh, a cool thing about the ISO surface is we can sort of trivially, like before you saw it, it was a big mass of uh, veins inside a cube. If we say uh, artificially just chop off, so if the z component is less than zero, now we just always return negative one. That effectively chops off uh, half of the system, uh, and when you generate it, then um, you get it cut off. And then a little bit lower down here, if you put uh, if you modify the function a little bit so that deep inside the veins it also switches off, you can make them hollow. Um, so that's what I'm showing here. Uh, it kind of looks cooler when you start uh, getting, when they're growing a little bit more. And then another shot. And you can also kind of see the uh, the cell stuff, the spheres. Uh, you see a lot of circles in there. Um, this is brutal because you guys, uh, I'm getting, I get the feeling that most of you uh, don't uh, don't know about this. Well, okay, so we can skip the ISO services and stuff and get to the main topic of today. So that was all my experimentation with the cellular system. But, uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, people wanted uh, people wanted me to use open source software. And, uh, and now that I'm getting into skin and stuff, I want to be able to render these things much more realistically. Like, you may have noticed all of these renderings are sort of black and white uh, and, and boring. 
uh, if we have flies eyes say we want them to be iridescent and uh, reflective and creepy and maybe with hairs on them and stuff so anyway we have to get it start getting into uh, some serious rendering which software was the previous demo made with Maya um, yeah those renderings are were straight out of Maya uh, nothing fancy it was just the meshes that we generated loaded into Maya and then rendered um, but Maya costs a truckload, and uh, we should uh, take advantage of open source software when it's available. And it is available, and it's really cool, so let's go to it. Um, so, uh, I think that's in run, run 27. Okay, so uh, I looked around for open source rendering software, um, and by rendering software I mean something that will generate pretty images. There's a lot of, yeah, Blender, uh, well Blender doesn't, um, Blender is an example of an open source renderer, but I want something harder core than that. Um, uh, so uh, I evaluated a bunch of them. Yeah, oh, yeah, but you already know the topic of today's class. Um, so what I end, finally ended up uh, deciding on, oops, uh, was, is a renderer called Pixie. Um, and Pixie's coolest uh, feature is that it is RenderMan compatible. Um, so what is RenderMan? Um, RenderMan is the renderer that was developed by ILM uh, back in the early 80s. Um, and then uh, ILM decided they didn't want to do computer-generated stuff as their primary focus. So they spun off that group into a company called Pixar. And then Pixar went on to make uh, really cool rendering software and really cool movies. And uh, as a part of the spin-off deal, uh, ILM gets to use RenderMan uh, for free, uh, which is key because RenderMan is damn expensive. Um, but it really is probably still the best rendering software for uh, super realistic images. Um, there are lots of other ones out there. Like, I worked for a company called Mental Images that makes Mental Ray. Uh, that's also a nice renderer. But the truth is, RenderMan is still the best. Um, at the time, RenderMan was cool because it allowed you to write shaders. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're going we're gonna to render a ball very shortly here, too. Uh, so at the time it was cool because it had shaders which allowed you to write little snippets of code that would control how the surfaces of objects were rendered. Um, uh, today everybody has shaders. Um, what RenderMan's strength today is, really still is, uh, is the fact that it can create uh, renderings of uh, incredible detail, obscene detail. And the primary way it does that is via its uh, mechanism that it calls micropolygons. Like when you make meshes in Second Life, uh, you can see, you know, you know, you're familiar with the triangles that uh, you use to lay out your shapes. Um, RenderMan takes those triangles and at render time cuts them up again uh, so that each micropolygon that it calls them is about the size of a pixel on your screen. So, uh, if you can imagine that level of detail, um, uh, and then you are allowed to manipulate those with what they call a displacement shader. You can move those around to create uh, an obscene amount of detail. Uh, and that is, that is really why RenderMan is still the king, is because of its uh, displacement shaders. Um, and we'll see examples of that in a little bit. So that's about RenderMan. Um, it turns out there are at least three versions of RenderMan in open source software. Uh, I think one is 3 delight. 
you know what, I don't know how to spell delight all of a sudden, so let's just forget that one. Uh, and then the other one is... No pixie updates since mid-2009. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's still... Uh, there's, I don't know, I got... I had a problem and I got feedback from the developers. Um, um, but yeah, uh, I still... I still like them. Axis. Axis is the other one. Uh, so, uh, I tell you about these other ones uh, simply because um, to give you the feeling, the feel that there really is a huge community around RenderMan um, if there are three open source implementations. Uh, and there are any number of proprietary implementations everywhere. Uh, of the renderers, though, Pixie was the had the fullest set of features, and it seems to have pretty much all of the same features that RenderMan itself has. The biggest problem I have seen with Pixie so far is that it is much slower than RenderMan, and it's uh, it's buggy. Um, so uh, I guess you get what you pay for, uh, but it's good enough for what we're using it for. So. Um, Let's talk about what it does. So here in run 27, we've got our normal set of blah, blah, blah. Uh, so these cell files are from the simulation. Um, but let's look at this file I've got here called test.rib. Test.rib is a RenderMan file. Um, Yeah, my display is much slower than my voice, so I always have to time it right. It's not a very complicated file. Uh, <laughs> it says display here. Um, it says projection, uh, which is defines your camera, but it uses the default camera. Uh, world begin and world end. And inside we have uh, translate and a sphere. So let's see what happens when we guess what guess what happens when we run this through the renderer. Can you guess? Extra extra credit here. No guesses, really? Is anybody still left in the audience? <laughs> yeah, let me back my camera out here a second and see if there's anybody left in the audience. So here's the rendering from uh, that uh, uh, code if you will. Uh, so that's a rib file. It tells RenderMan how to render something. Um, and here we see that it renders a sphere. Um, it doesn't give you a mechanism to uh, specify the position of the camera. Um, the camera is always fixed at 0, 0, 0 looking down the Z axis. Uh, but um, it lets you move the rest of the world, so uh, that's effectively the same as moving the camera. So that's what we do. Uh, no light source. So there's no light source here. Uh, we're using the default built-in shader, uh, which sort of simulates the effect of a light source behind the camera. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to make this as simple as possible, so no light source, just the sphere. Um, yeah, because if we had a light source, then we would have to compute lighting, and that would mean having a shader, and you know, that's just too much work for us for our first uh, test. Um, but what about our second test? Uh, again, we have the same sorts of stuff. We translate the whole world, uh, but we specify a color. Uh, this color happens to be red, and then we do the sphere. Uh, here's a color, and this is blue. And here we have points, general polygons. Uh, this describes a set of polygons. Um, Luxray is fun. Is it fast enough to be worth it? But it, uh, well. um, yeah, my uh, all the other all the other renderers are are very nice. Uh, they're uh, especially the new uh, path tracers, uh, which RenderMan doesn't yet do uh, nicely. Uh, but you can't you can't beat these displacement shaders. I mean, you, you know the the detail. <laughs> the detail means a lot. But you know what? You'll see that for yourselves as soon as we get there. Um, these polygons uh, happen to be a cube, 
Um, uh, and let's see what happens when we render test two. Not so surprising. We get uh, uh, blue and red. Uh, bl blue and red. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is this is really nice if you want to make uh, a red sphere and a blue cube. But we're trying to render cellular systems, so we need to do a little bit more work. Um, here, let's take a look in the make file. So, uh, for not Unix people, uh, a make file uh, is a set of instructions for uh, making code. Um, but what I do with make files is abuse them to generate renderings too. Uh, because uh, the process for generating an image is very similar to the process for generating code. You have a bunch of inputs and a bunch of, and you have a final product. So, uh, uh, for those of you who can read make files, um, what I do is, uh, where do I, where do I generate? Oh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, I have these, so what I do is I start out with nothing and I run the cellular simulator to generate these cell files. Um, and then from the cell files, uh, the cell files just describe the positions of all of the cells. Um, from those cell files, what I want to do is I want to make uh, a RenderMan rib file that describes uh, that uh, uh, that uh, shape. And that's done with this program ISO here um, that we'll look at. Print rib, I think, is the code. And I'll go over this really fast. Uh, the only, you know, uh, unless you really care, you don't have to modify this code. Uh, uh, but the point is, uh, what we have to do is we have to get these meshes, these polygons, uh, out into a format that RenderMan understands. And we do that here. Um, um, uh, what we have is a mesh... Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Maybe I should rename it. Well, it won't stick around very long. Um, anyway, a polygon uh, is described in RenderMan, and it's described pretty much everywhere uh, in 3D graphics. Um, let's say you have uh, a polygon. say. <laughs> wow, isn't that nice? Um, and let me draw the points. So to describe this shape, um, you first tell the rendering software uh, what these points are. So you give these coordinates. So you say, here are all these points. And then you, so you say, hey, renderer, here's A, B, C, D, E, F. And then you say, hey, but uh, what I want to describe now are these triangles. And uh, a triangle is made up of A, B, C. And then we've got a triangle that's made up of C, D, F. And then we've got a triangle that's made up of C, E, F. And then we've got a triangle made up of B, C, E. Oops, B, C, E. Um, so that's what we have to put into our code here. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to tell it how many of these are coming first and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that's pretty much the gist of it. I sense a question coming. Um, 
and what you get. Triangle fan. Um, I don't know that Render Man does triangle fans, honestly. Uh, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why not. I think triangle fans are kind of have a questionable. I don't know. I don't know. I won't say anything. Uh, yeah, you could do a triangle fan, uh, but they're harder. Okay, so here let's look at one of these uh, rib files. You can save prims. <laughs> prims, really? <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, you can't, uh, because in the end they, they get diced up into micro polygons, uh, one per pixel. So there's no, there's no getting around that. Uh, you get a lot of detail, uh, regardless of how you describe your your shapes. Um, so this is a rib file for uh, one of those cellular systems. Um, you'll notice that it doesn't have any of the other information that we had in the uh, uh, in the rib file to do the rendering. Um, you see, there's no camera up there. Uh, oops, there's no camera up there. It just describes the shape. Uh, so what we're gonna do. is we're going to include it. So here in render rib, this is an example of what we're going to do. Again, we have the display, the projection. Uh, sides 2 tells it to render both the front side and the back side of the shapes. And then read archive here, super fancy, uh, tells it to read that file that we just made. So let's see what that looks like. my mouse. Oh my god, we're 50 minutes in. Oh, but we started a little bit late. I want to keep these to an hour. Uh, my last one ran to two hours, and that was, that killed everybody. Um, so, yay! We've got a rendering of the, of the, um, of the, uh, cellular system. And again, it's rendered with the, uh, default shader, uh, so it's as, as if it's white and it's as if the light is behind the camera. Um, so yay. Um, now via our uh, uh, make file, um, we generate the rib files by running ISO. Uh, we generate, so that generates all those rib files for us. Now we have a rule for TIFFs. Um, our outfit, our output files are going to be TIFF files, so we have a rule that says to make uh, a TIFF, you take a rib file and you take this program called RenderScript and you run RenderScript with uh, the rib file and send it to the renderer. So what is RenderScript? RenderScript is super trivial. It just makes that uh, uh, that header that we were looking at before. So it just prints out that display line and the projection line and the world begin and the sides and the translate. Um, but when you get down to the read archive, you'll see that it substitutes the uh, substitutes the rib file that we generated. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, so if we render script and then for example cells uh, 1400.rib and we pipe that to our renderer. Um, it'll do uh, oh yeah uh, with uh, yeah bas basically uh, RenderMan will do any kind of image generation you can imagine. Uh, you would need to so if you wanted to generate Z maps you would need to create a renderer uh, uh, shader rather that just stuck that information into the color channels. Um, or there are a myriad of other ways to do it. You can, render man will render to uh, uh, just arbitrary float files. So, uh, yeah, one of the coolest things, well, I'm getting sidetracked, and we're running out of time. 
Um, so, uh, the make file told Renderman how to make the cell files. The cell files are created by running the simulator. Uh, the rib files are made by running the ISO program on the cell file. Uh, the TIFF files are made by piping the rib files to the uh, renderer. And then all of those are... Um, I, I'm on a Mac, so I use QuickTime. But you can use any program to take a bunch of images and uh, shove them into an animation. Um, this is what you get. Um, the first thing you'll probably notice um, is that we're. It's very similar to the other rendering that I showed you a little bit ago, although it doesn't rotate. Um, the other thing, and I notice you guys aren't actually seeing much of it uh, on your end because you're only getting like one frame a second. Uh, we're seeing Pixies bugs. Uh, every now and then a little piece of junk will will uh, pop up. Uh, can convert uh, Z depth max to cloud points to generate mesh. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, Z depth map to cloud. Uh, RenderMan has a very nice point cloud file format that it uses. Um, I don't think it'll generate a mesh surface for you, but this library that I'm using will. Um, uh, so yeah, it wouldn't be too hard to do that with this code we've got in front of us. Um, what you really need to do is go back and watch <laughs> watch last class where I talk about this graphics library, which is super cool. Yeah, um, Let me start that again. Uh, so, yeah, the problem with Pixie here is that uh, off on the sides we're seeing little bits of junk. Um, those will go away if you re-render. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I almost suspect that Pixie has bugs in it intentionally to so that it doesn't compete too heavily with uh, the commercial render man. Because they're like... Nine years ago, there was another really good RenderMan open source project uh, that was better than RenderMan, and uh, Pixar took them out, uh, uh, destroyed them with lawsuits. So, uh, yeah, Pixar isn't always nice, unfortunately. Uh, that was BMRT, if you guys want to go Wikipedia that and see the drama. Um, so... Uh, we have an animation of it growing. Yay! Uh, but, um, if you remember... Yeah, I say um all the time, huh? If you remember, the point of all of this is to generate a cave system for me to live in. We're looking at it from the outside, so that's no good. That gives us no idea of what the caves are like. But now that we have control over the rendering, we can make the camera dance around anywhere we like. And that's what we'll do now, is we'll animate the camera so that it uh, moves along the caves. Uh, so again, we have the same sort of situation, but we this time we've modified render script so instead of, if you remember, uh, render script just uh, uh, spat out this display, projection, world map. Uh, now what we wanted to do is to move that camera around inside the tunnels. Uh, but unfortunately we can't move the camera, so we have to move the tunnels around the camera. Um, that's easy enough to do, really, you just uh, do everything opposite. Um, but we need to figure out the positions uh, inside the cave system. And we need to figure out the orientation of the camera when you're in there. So what I do is down here in main, um, I call compute camera. So compute camera takes a frame number. And let's go up and look at compute frame. Compute camera, sorry. Um, what compute camera does is uh, it finds the position of the camera for this frame. Um, 
which is magic, we'll talk about it in a second, but then it computes the position of the camera 150 frames ahead, and that is what, what it looks at. Uh, so that's how we get the orientation. So the camera will move along some path and will look 150 frames ahead of that path. Uh, and then if you want to actually look at the gross uh, conversion here, um, this is, uh, you convert it to polar coordinates and that gives you two rotations for the camera orientation. Um, now what we do is we compute the path position. Um, what we do is we just linearly interpolate along a set of uh, center points of cells. Um, what this does is it finds what cell, what two cells were between and then in, interpolates between them. And then up here for compute the path, this is the device, this is the code that finds which cells we're going to fly down. And all it does is it starts with cell zero, which is like the heart of the system. And, uh, then goes to the next, uh, so it looks at the cells that are connected to this one and moves to the one with the highest number. So that's the, that's the youngest cell. You know what, I think we go to the lowest number though. I changed that. Okay. Um, so, uh, so just by changing that render script, now we move the camera around, and let's see how that affects our animation. So we start out inside the cell system, and zoom, 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 we're moving along. Um, yeah, your, your frame rate's really low, so you can't tell that because we're doing linear interpolation along this path it's the the, the animation is jerky <laughs> it just look everything just looks jerky to you uh, and you'll see that the way the iso surface thing works we've got you know some surfaces that we probably don't like so much you know they're not they're kind of I don't, I don't know how to describe them they're let's just call them bad um, uh, but it's cool you know you're flying along caves here um, and they go on and on and on and on. No polyps? No polyps. I don't know what that means. You mean like tumors? Or do you mean no poly... No polynormals to do smoothing, maybe? Hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, yes. We have some polyps in here. Um... Uh, and uh, perhaps the most annoying thing is we can see these triangles pretty obviously, right? Uh, that, you know, it doesn't look natural. It's uh, it's bad in a lot it's of ways. It's 17 hours. Um, uh, but what we can do is I can show you now what I was talking about at the beginning of the class, which is uh, the beauty of those displacement shaders. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, detail to this surface um, somewhat just totally randomly. Um, uh, what we're doing now is we have what I'm calling a stalactite shader. So what is a shader? Yes. Um, that is part of the implicit surface business. Um, yeah, that's the metaballs. So the graphics library, I'm using a really cool graphics library in here uh, called CGAL. Um, and uh, from, so what I do is I create, uh, in a nutshell, I create uh, a field function that describes these services uh, basically by distance from cells. Um, and then the library generates a mesh surface and uh, it just sort of magically handles where these things split off from each other, if that makes sense. Um, that is the cool, like, 
probably the coolest aspect of uh, isometric surfaces um, is that they don't um, they 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 don't suffer from the problems of normal surface descriptions. Uh, you can merge them together. The name of the library is CGAL. Uh, you can Google for it. Uh, it's yeah, it's 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 very nice. Um, and if you watch last class, uh, you'll get to hear me talk all about it. <laughs> um, but getting back to RenderMan today, um, this is a shader. So this shader, uh, when RenderMan is rendering that cave system, ev for every pixel, uh, it calls this little bit of code uh, to move the position of uh, that pixel. Um, and how does it move that... Let's see. Do I even use n there? No, I don't use n. Yeah. Um, so all I do is I take the x, y, z coordinates, which are in, they come into the shader in the variable uppercase p. Um, I that's in uh, world coordinate system. So I transform it into object coordinate system um, because I I want it to be relative to the object, um, and then I call this function. Uh, noise, uh, noise with the position. Um, I take that uh, position. And I divide by size. That'll control the size of the noise. Um, but a no this noise function is uh, the generic noise function that you see all over the place in computer graphics. Uh, it was invented by Perlin, Ken Perlin. Um, it's uh, it has very nice properties, but essentially, it just gives you a number between zero and one. Um, uh, for different positions in space, and it smoothly shades between them. So it's not it's not like uh, static. It's sort of smooth. I wish I had a picture of it, uh, but I don't. Uh, but all we do then is we sh take that number between zero and one, and we multiply it by four, and we multiply it by the size, and we change p set y comp p here uh, just sets the y component of p uh, to uh, itself plus a little bit of noise and then it recalculates the normal for that position um, yes yes oh thank oh thank you yeah here let me yay you guys see I don't have to prepare for class at all because you guys will just do this for me <laughs> Here. I notice all these answers are coming from the front row. <laughs> oh, is that where the... Oh, crap. Now I just lost my camera. Oh, aren't you a handsome group of avatars? Um, reposition the camera again. Um, so that's a picture of the noise function. Although that doesn't look like it either, honestly. That looks like a bunch of levels mixed together. That's a fractal version of it. Um, it's much less uh, grainy. It's uh, um, it base. It kind of has the shape of a sinusoidal function. It's very smooth and and uh, second derivative continuous uh, for those who care about these things. Um, in fact, we'll get to see it up close now because um, our rendering uh, moves the point around. Uh, using just that noise function. Uh, da, 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 da. So, oh, and let's look at uh, render script. Uh, render script is the thing now that does the rendering. Um, you'll see that right here, all we do, the only difference to this program is that we added this line uh, that says displacement. Um, yeah, it's a uh, We'll get it. We'll, uh, I want to talk about. I have to talk about noise functions because that's procedural graphics, uh, uh, but just not today. We'll get to that. Um, so let's look at our movie here. And while I have a minute, let me reposition the camera. Okay. So there we go. Um, this is, uh, the caves with that noise function applied. Uh, and then let's animate. 
see this is gonna this is gonna be really brutal on you guys because you won't it looks nice uh, when you have 30 frames a second uh, when you don't it doesn't look so nice and oh and the detail is getting compressed badly as it's sent to you um, but yeah so this is the strength of render man with uh, a very simple function a uh, very simple piece of code now we've gone from something that looks very uh, polygonal and computer generated to something that looks not so at least so much um, if you were to slap some color on here um, in fact let me go dig up let me go dig up a picture um, uh, and again what it's doing is uh, it's effectively creating a little triangle for every pixel in the render And then I think we should more or less stop there for the day. Uh, yeah, that's all the material I'm going to cover. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, that's Render Man. Um, all these files will very shortly be available for you on the web. Um, uh, I hardly encourage you to play with them. Um, but first, uh, questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Do, do, do. No, no questions. Well, when from... is your next class? <laughs> uh, honestly, I don't know. Um, uh, it's been about a month since my first one. Um, I can easily see it taking another month. Uh, my personal life is hell right now, so, uh, but I am, am very committed to doing these, so I will suffer through. Um, Fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, what I want to do next time, like I said at the beginning, is, uh, so now that we have total programmatic control of our renderings, um, like, so with surface shaders, which affect the coloration, of these pixels um, and uh, uh, everything that the pixie renderer gives us uh, what I'm going to start doing is rendering these skins that I was talking about um, and uh, to get across the idea of uh, the fact that they're procedural I'm going to my the way I do that is I usually generate them with uh, very artificial man-made shapes so what I think I'll do is next time I'll make fonts uh, which so like the font that's rendered with flies eyes um, you know varying the size like say uh, like so the innermost Ooh, you know what I have a chalkboard uh, so like uh, this is the prototypical concept for uh, this. I have a square, um, and then I generate, using the cellular system, I generate these eyes in the middle. Um, and they're covered with those uh, little dots to represent the millions of eyes on a fly, and they're iridescent. And then in here, we've got some kind of gross, uh, f what I'm going to call fly skin wrinkles that grow around these eyes. And when you get out to the edges, uh, they stop being wrinkles so much and they become they start becoming uh, little cells. Um, and the idea is that once you can grow this stuff procedurally, you have total control. You can do neat things uh, like one of one of the targets I'm aiming for here uh, I, you know I sort of hinted at it earlier uh, I want to construct an entire organism uh, that looks sort of realistic uh, from these rules uh, and have it grow from an embryo to uh, its life-size uh, equivalent 
Um, and then to show off the proceduralness, uh, I then stick that embryo inside a glass bottle and grow it again and watch it become disfigured as it presses against the glass. So that's sort of like uh, where I'm going with this cellular system business. Uh, so hopefully uh, that's cool enough to keep you guys interested. Um, but next time, yeah, I'll start. We'll start getting into uh, rendering these shapes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, real cave system would follow a void. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So you have um, my my system didn't do that at all, but you have the flexibility to uh, uh, modify the growth rules any way you want. Um, then, so that at the topmost level, you would change where the cells position themselves, uh, based on, say, bedrock or, uh, clay or, you know, whatever you wanted to do, uh, limestone. Um, then at the next level down, you could control the way, uh, the ISO surface generates here. You know what? I want to show you a picture that I did for a film project. Um... It just so happens that I worked on uh, a film project that had caves, <laughs> um, which is probably where a lot of these cave ideas came from. Um, it was the previous stuff for Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, here is uh, the still from this. So uh, what we did, um, this is an ISO service that was hand constructed. It's just like a sphere with uh, columns in the middle of it. Uh, the, so the ISO surface then has rules um, to come through and add sort of layer, uh, I guess you don't really see it, but to add horizontal, horizontal uh, stratification for uh, sort of, a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? sedimentary rock sort of stuff. Um, and then on the very top, we've got uh, uh, a displacement shader doing the stalactites. Um, and this was... this We put this together... Well, the stalactite shader came from my friend. I don't know how long it took him to do that. He, he built it for a different project. But this took us like a day's worth of effort. Um, and uh, and that's uh, that's kind of impressive. Um, getting this much detail in uh, a full environment. Um, and that that's, you know, the power of uh, procedural systems. Because once you get, you know, uh, a little bit, you can hit a button and it becomes a lot. Um, more questions? Come on. You can ask dumb questions now. Scroll up. I don't know what you mean. No questions. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, uh, again, uh, I encourage you... Uh, you know what? I don't just encourage you. I demand. Uh, but you couldn't use the Perlin routine usefully in SL. Um, you can write... You could write the the Perlin function in LSL, but you can't generate uh, shapes from you can't generate meshes in LSL. Uh, so maybe you could do it with sculpties. <laughs> um, thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, mandatory though, uh, if you're going to come back to next time's class, you have to download the files and you have to make something original. Um, it can be as simple as. Uh, taking the object files that are in there and re-rendering them in a pretty way or import, importing them into Second Life Mesh or something. But you have to do something original um, uh, or you're in trouble. And uh, when you get it done, uh, slap it on the web somewhere and send me a link and I will create a page for that. At the joints by adding a billion. Ooh, what's your question, Cypher? For... Oh... Um, well, the isosurface can generate low enough res, 
uh, low enough res meshes that you can import them. Can do caves and open sim. Ooh. Okay. Um, really? I am going to stop recording. Um, take care, everybody, and I will let you know. Uh, send me an email so that I can uh, contact each of you specifically to make sure that you know about next class. Okay, and with that... Thanks, Carl. And maybe send your link to the first class that most people missed. Um, uh, yeah, I, can s I think that was in the chat history. Uh, let me scroll. Your email so that we can send you email. Is it on your website? Um, it's it's kind of tricky to remember. Um, there it is. <laughs> Thank you for the eraser. Cool, cool. It's very tricky. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, take care, guys.